Today, we're celebrating fathers. Can I get a show of hands? How many fathers are in the room? Wow. Yeah, you, fathers deserve a hand. I know. We need help. Um, and so, <laughs> and those watching online, you can raise your hand as well, but nobody will see it. Um, but we want to say thank you so much for tuning in. You're part of our family as well. We're, we're excited to celebrate Father's Day because I believe that it's a day to be celebrated because God has given a mantle of authority and responsibility to fathers that when they walk out in that, man, it, it leaves a lasting impression for the next generation. Now, growing up, you might not have had the best father experience, or you might not have had the greatest example of what it means to be a father, or maybe maybe you had a great earthly father, but wherever you're coming from, today we're going to look at a heavenly father. We're going to look at what a heavenly father looks like, and today's sermon is entitled, Good Dad, Bad Dad, and it comes from the wise Evangeline Kyriakos, my daughter, Evie. You see, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But when we think about fathers, uh, you might think, man, I wish I had a dad like Mufasa. Not just fun to say, Mufasa. And it has like a nice growl to it because he was a lion. And he was, he was bold. He was courageous. He, he, he led his, his family well, but he died. Uh, but the sad part, sorry, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen that movie, it's your fault. This is, that was in the 90s. Okay. But maybe we're like, I wish we had a father like that. Or maybe we wish we had a father like Homer Simpson from Springfield, Oregon. Um, or maybe you're thinking, you know, I wish my dad was more like Darth Vader because, you know, he, he's, he's a conflicted hero there, isn't he? Maybe he's a villain. But, you know, whatever dad you had, whatever dad you grew up with or maybe not even had in, present in your life, can I encourage you, there's a heavenly father that sets an example of a good father. And it's someone that we want to look to. And and happy Father's Day to each and every single one of us because we get to celebrate our heavenly Father. Can you say amen to that? And being a dad, it's a lot of work. You have to be ready to answer questions right in a moment's notice. And my daughter, Evie, uh, we were talking, and the first thing that really caught my attention is she said, Dad, what is anxiety? And I'm thinking, if you don't know, she's six years old. So I'm thinking, why is my six-year-old asking me what anxiety is? And so I turned to her, I said, baby girl, this question is anxiety. Why are you asking this? <laughs> and she said, oh, I don't know. I just heard about anxiety. And so I want to know, what's anxiety? And so like a good, wise father, I turned the question on her and I said, baby girl, what do you think anxiety is? She looks at me and she said, she's just like me. She said, I don't know. That's why I asked you. Well, I started to preach to her. I pulled out a sermon and I said, honey, the anxiety is actually this. It's when you don't put your trust or your faith or your hope in God and you place it in the circumstances that are not going well. And then you, you get this feeling of anxiety because the Bible says to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Or don't, don't be anxious about anything, but with everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you get it, baby girl? And she's like, Uh, okay. I thought about taking an offering right there because that was golden. But, but you know, fathers, what is a father? A father is a source for help, a a source for wisdom, a source for confidence. And I love talking about my kids because I wouldn't be a father without them. And so I need to tell you another story. Evie, uh, we, were, we, we got her this rubber band launcher because Christina and I were on a trip, and so we came home. We brought back these rubber band launchers. Now, these are weapons, and you probably shouldn't give them to six-year-olds, but I know that now. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And so I, I give her this rubber band weapon, and we're, we're playing and we're shooting each other with this rubber band launcher. And then she goes up to her mom, and she says, I have a great idea. I'm going to freeze Daddy so he can't move and he can't fight back. And so she does that. She says, freeze. So I stand still because I'm a good dad. And then she comes up to me and she shoots me in the face. <laughs> Just capped me right there. And, and I'm looking at her. I'm like, oh, it's on. And so I just like unload. She's six. Um, but I, I just start shooting her relentlessly with rubber bands. 
And she's like, ow, ow, dad, stop. Ow, what kind of dad are you trying to be right now? A good dad or a bad dad? Because I'm not sure right now. And that's where the title of the sermon comes from. And so the evangelist, Evie Kiriakos. You see, a, a dad is supposed to be a source for wisdom, for help, for confidence, for understanding. Someone you can look to when you need help. And it reminds me of this husband and wife. They were elderly and they were sitting in church. And the wife lets out one of those SBDs. Do you know what those are? Silent but deadly. Yeah, farts. So she, she lets one out and she's like, uh-oh. She turns to her husband and says, honey, I just let out the biggest SBD ever. What should I do? And he says, change the batteries in your hearing aids. Dad jokes, you gotta love them. It's Father's Day, you gotta, you gotta throw them in there. But let me ask you a question. What is the heart of a father? What is the heart of a father? And let me follow up that question with this question. What do you think God thinks about you? What do you think God thinks about you? When he's, when he's thinking about you, does he, does he think I'm disappointed with that person? Oh, they'll never get it right. What does he think about you? What does your heavenly father think? Because if we're honest, sometimes we might go negative with it, but I think our heavenly father is a loving father. And we're going to see that in the, in the story of the prodigal son. And I want to be a good communicator. I want to be able to communicate to the next generation clearly and effectively. And so I went out and I bought a Gen Z Bible. And so we're going to read this together. It's out of the Gen Z version. Uh, it's going to be on the screen. Ready, get set, Go. Holy bro began to teach in parables so that if you know, you know. Did you just say ick yik? <laughs> ick yik. Okay, so you know what? I did this. I, I grabbed this Bible, and I, it's, I wouldn't even call it a Bible. It's a, it's a little storybook. Um, so I took it, and I went to different people, and I asked them to read it as best as they could, and I filmed them without their consent. And so I love our pastor, Pastor Wayne Cordero. He is so amazing. And Let's try to follow along with him as he reads. I can't read it. <laughs> Holy bro began to teach in parables so that I know what you know saying. There was a spoiled bro who wanted to live his best life, so he manifested it by asking his dad for stacks. He said, Dad, here's half all the money, uno reverse. And he received half of his dad's money. Then he ghosted everyone and hit every club, pulling left and right with the rich kid Riz. But he was always too thirsty, and soon he ran out of stacks. Then all of the bussin' went away, and he had to earn his bread. But there was no bread, so he was in his fields. Then he realized home was always bussin' for free, and that his dad was the only real one who ever stand him. So he entered his sorry era and went home to low-key apologize for being so out of pocket. <laughs> Come on, we gotta give him a hand. Let me, let, me, let me just finish this story. When he pulled up, he prepared himself to catch hands, but his dad said, let's go, my boy is back. Now, bro's older brother, he had no chill and told their dad, me personally, I'm not gonna let that slide. Like, bro was down bad and wasted all that money just because he was feeling some type of way. And for what? So how are you gonna be throwing him a banger right now? And why are you being moting right now? But his dad said, bruh. Life already threw hands with my boy, but he respond, and now he can finally live his best life. Come on, let's go. I don't understand half of what I just said. I just can read it. It's one of those things where, you know, we're reading this in this Gen Z language that didn't exist in first century Jerusalem. This is something that I think it highlights the issue here. When we read the prodigal son story, I think we need as best as we can to put our mindset in the minds of the listeners and the readers in those days. What happened prior to this is actually this. Uh, Luke chapter 15 is a story about the lost things. Jesus is sitting around a table, and, and when you read the book of Luke, I love Jesus because in Luke, he's either going to somewhere to eat He's eating somewhere, 
or he's leaving from just having eaten somewhere. He's constantly eating. Jesus must have been huge. But this is the thing that uh, eating a meal together shows relationship. And so it's a way that Jesus showed relationship and valued people. And that's why Luke highlights this. And so there are three things, three stories that Jesus shares. It's about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. See, Luke chapter 15 is all about lost things. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And it says this in 15, one verses, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You see, in those days, sharing a meal with someone, it was a sacramental type of thing to do. It was, it was almost sacred in a way where you would share a meal with someone and there would be an intimacy in that moment because you were letting them into your home and you were allowing them into your life. Now, the religious leaders in those days, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to let uh, the sinners part of their life. They didn't want to even engage with them. But Jesus shows value to them by saying, you know what? You are valuable to God and to his kingdom, and I'm going to share a meal with you. He broke the norm. He broke all traditional norms in that moment by doing this. And so he didn't endorse their behavior, but he endorsed them as valuable human beings to God. And so Jesus tells these three stories back to back, the lost things. But who is he telling these stories to? The sinners and the tax collectors? That wasn't a rhetorical question. You feel free to answer. No, he was actually telling them to the religious leaders. He was telling them to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law because they were the ones muttering and complaining about him. And so Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, this is an atrocious thing for someone to say in those days. As a son, you would not go up to your father while he's still alive and say, Father, give me my share of the inheritance because it's tantamount to saying, I wish you were dead already so I could have my money and go. This is a very bad thing to say. And any normal father in those days would have said no and may have gone as far as cutting him off from the inheritance, saying, you are no longer my son, for even having asked this. It was a a serious crime to even do something like this. However, it's actually a beautiful depiction of God's free gift of free will. You see, you and I have free will, and that free will doesn't end at the ability to choose God. You see, free will is the freedom to choose or to reject God's love. And it's a, it's a gift because the, the father in this story gives the son his share of the inheritance. And you're, you might be thinking, well, why would he do that? Because it was a free gift that the son was willing to, if he would steward it right, he could steward it well. Man, it would be a gift and a blessing to him, but if he steward it poorly, it would be a curse unto him. And so not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living after he had spent everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, when we think of famine, this doesn't mean that Safeway just ran out of groceries. This isn't Costco ran out of toilet paper again. This isn't that kind of famine. This is people are dying because there is no food anywhere. And so when, when he came across, came into this famine, he had no money, he had nothing, he was destitute. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country. It actually says he clung to that person. He glued himself to that person who sent him to feed, the, to the fields, to feed pigs. Now, as a good Jewish boy, you would not do this. You would not feed pigs because pigs are unclean animals and you're not supposed to even take care of them as a flock because they're detestable. And so he was breaking all of his customs. He was falling so far from the grace and the faith that he grew up in. And so he was feeding the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Have you ever seen swine in their pig pen 
and thought, that looks delicious. The pig, yes, but I'm talking about what the pigs are eating. No, that's not something I think any of us would do. And that shows you how low and how destitute his situation was, where he was so desperate for anything to fill his stomach that he was willing to eat the unclean animal's food. Man, how far he has fallen in this moment. Now, everything the son has done up until this point, it could be summarized as idiotic. The son would mark off what we would call a foolish person. And we've been reading through the the book of Proverbs not too long ago. And and I love Proverbs because Proverbs is wisdom for everyday life. It's, it's the ability to, to read God's word and understand that there is wisdom available to us. And when we see the acts of a, a wise person, we're like, that's wisdom. And when we see the acts of a foolish person, we're like, that's foolishness. And, and really, this book shows that there's wisdom and foolishness, and you have to pick them. But the theologian Dwight Schrute put it best in, in, the, in the TV show, The Office, when he says... Uh, Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. That's a great summary of the book of Proverbs. There you go. But this son does everything you would expect him not to do. He does everything wrong. And I want to pause right here and ask a question. Are there people in your life that you are just desperately hoping praying, wishing upon wish, hoping upon hope that they would come to their senses and start living right. Come on, I'm willing to, I'm willing to wager every single one of us could find somebody. And, and we're just crying out to God, or maybe, maybe it's us. Maybe we're that person people are pleading for. But the thing is, there is going to be a moment, I believe, if we have enough faith and we have enough hope and we allow enough room, there's going to be a moment where they might come to their senses because it says this, not long, uh, so he was there and then he, um, he came to his senses. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. You see, each of us probably have someone that we're, we're waiting for them to come to their senses. But maybe the, the, the part where they come to their senses is at rock bottom. Because when you look at this son's life, everything was spiraling from worse to worse to worse as he was going down and down, dooby 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 down. He was going so far down that there was no hope for him to even return to the home that he once called home. Now, sometimes it's the lowest places that brings us to the highest throne room. Say that again. It's the lowest places that can bring us to the highest throne room. And some of us, we might need to go this far in order to realize that we're at the end of ourselves. But my prayer is that we would all be quick to repentance. That as soon as we see, oh, I've made a misstep, we don't keep going down that. We turn and we come back home. Now, some of us, we might need a little more encouragement. We might need famines. We might need to be destitute in order to realize I've tried life my own way and it just doesn't work. So the son says this, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know, sadly, the prodigal son, in this moment, this is not true repentance. It's a rehearsed speech. It's not true repentance yet. See, what's what's happening here is he's saying, you know, I'm I'm hungry and I want to get fed. And my father has a lot of food. So I'm just going to go home and I'm going to say, make me a hired servant. So because in his mind, it's still a money problem. But at the, at the core of it, he broke his father's heart. He didn't realize that what his actions did wounded his father's heart, not his wallet. And so he's trying to 
come back on his own terms. He's trying to make amends in his own way. He's trying to find reconciliation in a way that avoids conflict. Because what he's saying is, treat me as a hired servant so I won't live in the home so I don't have to face my father. I don't have to face my older brother. I can live with the other servants and I can learn a trade craft and I can make money on my own and I can maybe one day pay my father back. That's his confession in this moment. So he doesn't truly understand the depth of what he's done to hurt his father. The prodigal is not truly returning home yet. He's merely going back to servitude. He's going back. He's going to be on the doorstep of his home, but still so far from the father's heart. And understanding what a heavenly father really looks like. So he's still lost, even on his father's doorstep. So the son got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. Can you say that with me? He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is key. This is probably the most crucial verse in this whole story. Because when he was on his way to his father, his father saw him from a long way off and ran to him. Now, the word here in Greek is dramon, which means he raced. And we know the Olympic trials are coming up here in Eugene. And in fact, we are known as track town. That was weak. Um, Let's try that again. Uh, We are track town. Okay, so we know about running here. Well, I don't know much about running. But we know about running here in Eugene. And we know about competitive racing. And this word that is used here is used intentionally by the author Luke to convey what Jesus is communicating. He didn't just run to his son. No, he raced with all diligence, with with a haste. He knew I needed to get there first. Well, what was he racing? Why was he running? Because in those days, for an elderly man to to gird up his his wear and to run and show his legs, it was disgraceful. It was actually showing shame to himself. And what the father did was shameful in that culture for him to run and hurry himself because as a distinguished man, as an elderly gentleman, people came to him. He didn't run to them. He was established. He was wealthy. He was was someone that people would seek an audience with. He didn't run for anyone. But he ran to his son. And when I was digging into this, I was like, why was he racing? Why did he have to get there first? Well, in first century Judaism, they they had a ceremony or they had a custom where if there was someone that left home and squandered the family's wealth and lived amongst Gentiles and lost everything the family had, they had this custom called kazaza. And now kazaza means cut off. And so when this individual would come home and they, they lost everything that the family owned, they would take a large pot like this, they would go up to them loudly in front of all the townspeople and they'd yell kazaza and they'd break a giant piece of pottery. I'm sorry if I just woke you up, but that's your fault for sleeping. (laughs) My fault for putting you there. But kazaza literally means cut off. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome as part of this community. You are cut off. So his father, what was he racing? He was racing against shame. He was racing to get there before anyone in the community could cut his son off. And so he raced with all diligence, knowing knowing that he had to get there first because his son needed to know that he was still welcome. It was his heart to show compassion. It was his heart to race there to show that he still loved his son. And and everyone in the street around, they would be seeing this and they would be following after the father to see why is this man hastily running this direction. So they would follow as well and they would see this embrace. They would see this beautiful depiction of the father's heart. It said, the son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But even before the son made that confession, which if you notice, it changed. It no longer says, treat me as one of your hired servants. See, somewhere in that embrace, the the father changed the son's heart. When he embraced him, when he kissed him, when the townspeople saw this son was still welcome, was still loved, was still accepted, man, it did something internally to him. Notice that it's become an unconditional, I'm sorry. And often the three hardest things for us to say is, I'm sorry, I need help, and we're just Chester Sire sauce. <laughs> Worcestershire sauce. But honestly, it's the hardest thing for us to say is, I'm sorry, I need help. Please forgive me. And the son, with all boldness, says, I'm sorry, I messed up. Now, going back to verse 20, notice something. The kiss came before the confession. The father's kiss came before the confession. He already said, I have compassion. I love you. You are still my son. The son says, I'm no longer fit to become, be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That's what he's saying in his mind. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, three things happened here. When the father put the robe on his son, he was reaffirming his identity. No, you are my son. This robe proves you are my son. When he put sandals on his feet, in those days, slaves went barefoot. Only sons and esteemed people wore footwear. And so he was saying, I'm going to restore your dignity. So he, he reestablishes his, uh, his identity, he restores his dignity, and then he gives him authority because the ring was a signet ring that allowed him to do business in the father's name. And so in a one fell swoop, he reestablished the identity of his son, the dignity of his son, and the authority of his son. All in one moment. What a compassionate, loving father. The son did not deserve any of that, but yet the father freely gave it. And this is a beautiful depiction of Jesus' work on the cross. You see, when Jesus took upon the shame of himself, when he raced to Golgotha, when he knew what was at stake, when he needed to cut off the enemy to make it there first so that we would know there is no shame too great, no depth too big, that we cannot make it to God because he's made it all the way to us. Can you say amen to that? 1 John 3, 1 says, what love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called the sons and daughters of God, children of God. What love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the the children of God. You see, there is such love from God that we don't yet deserve. We, We might never, quote unquote, deserve it or earn it, but God freely gives it. Now, here's the twist in the story. There's, every good story has a twist. And mine is, I need to twist off this cap and drink some water. Just talk amongst yourselves. It's very refreshing. I still feel like I have to cough. I'll just do one. (coughs) Thank you. Um, We live in Death Valley, allergy season. If you're watching online, you probably have allergies to being here. Um, But thank you for joining us. Here's the twist in the story. The twist is this. The older son was not happy. The older son was not excited his brother returned. Meanwhile, the son, the older son, was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? 
Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Man, that's how God feels. When, when one of us as a sinner repents and turns to God, it's not that my son that was wayward has come home. I have him back safe and sound. It's a loving heart. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you. You see, the, the older son, he didn't see himself as a son either. He saw himself as a slave as well. That's the twist. You can be in the father's house, but so far from his heart. You can be in the house of God, yet not understand his heart. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you've never given me a, even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he disassociates himself with his brother. Do you see that? He doesn't say, when my brother, he says, when this son of yours comes back and he squandered your property with prostitutes, he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? You see, there are two very unhappy characters in this story. The first is the older, older son. The second is the fattened calf. <laughs> very unhappy. But you can be in the father's house but never understand his heart. You can bear the father's name but misrepresent his heart. And this brother, he was being a quid pro bro. He, he was like, it's got to be quid pro quo. And, and if it's not the way I think it should go, man, when you read the story, and if you're honest, like, I, I need to be honest. When you're reading it and you see the forgiveness of the father, before he even apologizes, that's not how it goes. That's not the right order. They're supposed to say, I'm sorry, and then you say, I forgive you. They're supposed to say, I messed up, and then you can say, you're welcome home. No, he welcomes him home before he even has the chance to utter the words, I'm sorry. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He was lost and is found. See, the, the father's heart actually leaves it open-ended right here. That's the end of the story. You, you think there's a plot hole somewhere because the story doesn't conclude, but this is Jesus' intention because the question now comes to us. What would we do in the waiting? Will we be like the older son? An and example, a bad dad, or will we be like this loving father that examples the heart of God, a good dad? one that shows there is forgiveness and grace available to anyone who is willing to receive it. See, there are two sons, one in rebellion and one in resentment. There were two lost sons. Both sons were lost. The parable could actually be called the two lost sons. Both needed the father's love. It was a tale of two slaves. One was enslaved to his lifestyle the other was enslaved to his self-righteousness. The two slaves. The younger son left home. The older son never understood home. The father went out to find both the younger and the older son. You see that? He didn't just go and run to the younger son. He left the party to find the older son. And this is key to understanding the heart of our Heavenly Father. He meets you right where you are, wherever you are. You see, you're never too far gone for God to meet you there, and you're never even thinking you're too close and in proximity of the Father to miss his heart. And so God will meet you right where you are, and he wants to show you his heart. Who do you know that is still far from God? And what do you think about them? When they, when they come to your mind, do you think bitterness and resentment? Or do you think, I hope they come home one day? And are you ready and willing to receive them and reconnect them to the Father's heart and understand that God has a good pleasure to give 
every person in the kingdom, and all they have to do is receive it. Because forgiveness is available because it was paid for by Jesus. It's not something we have to earn our way back. And so why, why would we ever challenge people with earning their way into God's kingdom when we ourselves were never facing that challenge? See, it's a free gift. So are you filled with love and compassion? Because there's going to be a moment when people come to their senses. And will we be ready? That's my heart. That's my prayer that we would be a people that are ready and willing to receive those that turn to God on a moment's notice. And just like that father, we would run to them and show them that they are loved, dearly loved, and called children of God. Can we bow our heads? If you're in this room, or if you're watching online, and maybe that's you. Maybe you feel some tugging on your heart. Maybe something in, in, inspiring you inside to say, you know, that's me. I need to come home. I've been living life my own way. I've been doing it the way I think is best, but I'm realizing it's not working. It's not worth it. Something is missing. Can I encourage you? Come home. Today's the day of your salvation. You don't have to earn your way back. There is a loving father ready and willing to receive you in his arms. And so if that's you, can you boldly just lift a hand and say, that's me. I want to say yes to Jesus. I see those hands. Anyone else? I see that hand as well. We'll just give another moment. Those watching online as well. You can put your hands down. Now, maybe there's some of us in here that we've been wronged. We've been hurt. We, we feel like there's there's some sort of resentment that still we haven't let go of yet because there's someone we love or someone we know has deeply wounded us. Can I encourage you, today is the day to, to be free in Jesus Christ, to lay that at the Father's feet as well and say, you know what, Lord, I know that you are a gracious, compassionate, and loving God, and you will deal with this situation the best way. And so, Lord, I lay it down at your feet. If that's you, could you raise a hand boldly saying, you know, I need to let some resentment go. I need to let some bitterness go. I see many hands and yeah, many of us. You can put your hands down. Well, we're, I'm gonna pray a prayer with you and if you could pray the prayer with me and we'll all say it together. And if you just said yes to Jesus, would you pray this with all your heart? It goes like this. Dear Jesus, thank you that you came and you died for my sin so that I might have life everlasting. Lord, change me. Make me the person you created me to be. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. So now I say this, so I can hear myself, so those around me can hear, so even the devil would know, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my savior. My life belongs to him now and forever. Lord, that's our heart's cry, that we would be a people that belong to you wholeheartedly, that we hold nothing back from you, knowing that, Lord, you are the good Father who loves us dearly and is your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And so right now, Lord, we just ask that those that said yes to you this morning, they would walk in boldness and in faith and in love, knowing that the Father's heart is for them. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen, amen, and amen.